Yes? Okay. Okay, so I'm happy to welcome you back after a relaxing and delicious lunch and the in-depth discussions. I participated in the third one on mobility, uh, lots of uh, food for thought, but I would be very interested in knowing what you discussed in the other two workshops, and if you are also curious, uh, our contractor, Ecoris, will be preparing a report with the outcomes of this discussion, so we will all be able to, to know about uh, the interesting insights of all our participants. And now uh, we are having our last session. Uh, our last session is about hearing the voices of apprentices. You know that we are now in the European Year of Youth, the European Year of Youth is about having the voice of the young generation heard so we can integrate their opinions in our policy making. And we are trying to do that our, at our level uh, in the field of apprenticeships uh, through EAM, the European Apprentices Network, which is an organization trying to boost the representation of apprentices at national and local uh, level. So I invite all the representatives um, of EAN uh, here uh, on the stage. <laughs> mm. yes. They will share with us their uh, opinions on the topics that were discussed today, and the session will be moderated by Ben Kingcross. Welcome, Ben. 
<laughs> Thank you very much. Goodness, talking to a room full of adults is far more terrifying than talking to a room full of apprentices. Um, so, uh, uh, and Ferrier at last. Thank you very much. Come and have a seat. So, uh, yeah, we'll clap Ferrier as well. Um, uh, the European Apprentice Network uh, ha has been in Vienna since Wednesday, preparing what they would like to speak to you about. Uh, just for you as preparation, there will be questions at the end, and we will be talking about the topics of automation, about gender, about mobility, and a just green, just green transition. Uh, as a native speaker, I trip over that one, so good luck later on. Um, so have a think about what kind of questions you would like to ask uh, the apprentices. Uh, it was excellent hearing from uh, the speakers uh, up here earlier who were saying very directly that they were listening to and speaking to apprentices directly. So we'll start with Ferrer, then uh, after that is Laura. So if Ferrer, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, oh, I've forgotten something. My name is Ben and I use the pronouns he, him. Okay, uh, Ferre, so if you would like to uh, just let everybody know who you are and, and a little bit about your story. Yes, uh, I'm Ferre. Uh, I'm from uh, SNCB. Um, yes, and um, I'm starting with, uh, my father was an electrician, so my choice was easy and quickly um, made to go in his footsteps. Uh, my first opportunity ship was with an uh, independent electrician for one whole year. Uh, the, the year after that, I to search for another opportunity ship. Since I had interest in trains, my choice was easily and quickly made to the SNCB. By doing my second entering year with the SNCB, I have learning so much about industrial and pneumatic parts of a train. I won't have learning anywhere else which is so fun fascinating to see and to learn about. And when I got the offer to start working with the SNCB, I had second to touch ab about it. Uh, to this day, I'm so grateful that I had opportunity to still a part of SNCB. Fantastic. <laughs> thank you, Ferre, and thank you for giving uh, that the, a reminder to us about the fact that apprenticeships are, are a personal thing and that each apprentice that we work with is an individual with a story. So cool, thank you very much, Ferre. Um, Laura, I think it is you next. Off you go. I hope that my microphone you. Okay, so good evening you all. I'm uh, Laura Pantone, she, her, and I am a train driver in Italy. And uh, currently I am, I am on behalf of Trade Union today. So I'm really honored to be here with, with you all. And uh, I think that after, the day, after today, we have to tackle uh, another big elephant in the room that is uh, automatization of my, of my labor. So I think that uh, we should address something about that. So as we have read uh, into the smart and sustainable mobility strategy, the pillar uh, number 12 is that uh, uh, automated mobility will be deployed on a large scale. So <laughs> that is a real big issue for us. And uh, also we know that the entity entitled to develop ATO, automated train operation, is currently shift to rail. So speaking about people behind uh, this profession, uh, as far as we know, uh, we are uh, around 300,000 train drivers across Europe. So I think that uh, we should um, we should tackle the future of, uh, of the labor that we'll uh, encounter in the next 10, uh, 10 years. And uh, it's interesting because in the same uh, uh, smart and sustainable mobility strategy, it was written that further recommendation from the European Commission would have been occurred, but uh, 
as far as we know, no document uh, has arrived yet about the future uh, of this job. So, as a trade unionist, even, even if we are worried about employment level, we should think also about income levels. Because even if salaries of train drivers differ state by state, a big part of train driver's salary comes from allowances, as we know, for example, driving allowances, shift allowances, etc. And uh, that would have been cut uh, until uh, 40% in some cases if they should be reallocated to different job positions compatible with their technical profile. So, moreover, it's not still clear the position of train drivers during the transition towards ATO. For example, as uh, we know from uh, current news, SNCF is speaking about driving supervisor during this uh, hybrid mode of conduction. And uh, the border between liability of the machine, so the train, and the conductor's liability is li really blurred and put these workers to higher risk to be liable for something that should have been decided by the machine itself without the possibility of immediate intervention. So, in the end, as a trade union, we think that uh, the salary of these workers should not be uh, reduced at the moment for several reasons. The number one, the higher machine complexity, since uh, it is driven by autonomous uh, intelligence, artificial intelligence. The higher, the higher English level required, since uh, it has been a problem nowadays. And uh, also, we would like to address the risks derived by extreme climate events. So, for example, personnel involved in train operation will meet more often extreme climate events. Weather conditions are going to become more challenging than in the past, and workers will be put on higher safety risk. For this reason, it could be interesting to think about the climate risk allowances for workers involved in train operation. So, in the end, one of the other things, the untangled responsibility matter. So, towards the transition to a driverless train, uh, the train driver is, is going to become a conduction supervisor, but uh, it's not clear its role and liability limits, as we said before. So, in hybrid conduction, who is responsible for a collision? The train, so the train constructor or the railway undertaking, or the train driver, and why? So, and in the end, as a trade union, we would like to support uh, Europe together with stakeholders to encourage university education for younger workers to be re-employed more easily, uh, following the, uh, the concept of uh, lifelong training uh, for workers. is not specified the type of uh, training that we should get, and uh, is not specified that we have to retrain to get the same income level of the previous uh, work that we had. So, I think that it's important to tackle this, uh, this topic of uh, the income level, because it's not uh, discussed, and I think that I have a duty today to be here, and uh, also towards my colleagues in Italy and uh, in other member states to understand what's our future. And in the end, the motto of ERA, the European Railway Agency, is the railway for a better society. But uh, how, could be, how could we be an uh, example for a society where train drivers are the first in place to go through an unjust transition? Very much. Yeah. Thank you, Laura. Uh, and I'm, I'm always shocked at just the, the depth of technical knowledge that the young apprentices have, that there are, I for one am very comfortable now thinking about going and traveling on Italian trains. If you're, uh, yeah. if you're going to be driving me, I'll feel very safe. Um, fabulous. So the next up we have Lorenzo and Simon. Well, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Fantastic. I would like to... Uh, to tell you that I'm from UIC, the International Union of Railways, and I identify as he, him. I would like to drive your attention towards a few concepts. The first one is that future generations, and therefore future apprentices and employees, will have sustainability as a core value, and that they will want to apply to companies and jobs that can reflect such value. Secondly, 
I think that there's a growing attention for customers, consumers and institutions if we think about the European Directive regarding the, the sharing of non-financial data towards sustainability performances of companies. And I think that these two pillars paved the way to the fact that there's a huge gap for new professionals within the sustainability field that has to be addressed. So we need young professionals within the sustainability field. And this can be translated into programs where uh, young professionals learn about the environmental, social and governance, ESG performances of companies and they get trained on many different fields from human capital management to sustainability reporting to, for example, the use of life cycle assessment softwares and tools. And at the same time learn about, for example, the materiality analysis of, uh, of their company. So as sustainability is an holistic concept, I think there's the need for horizontal and holistic uh, approach and skills and professionals. And I would like to leave the floor now to Simon that will go in depth more on this sustainability topic. So thank you very much. Not sure how I follow some of these people. They're amazing, aren't they? Uh, I'm Simon, he, they. Um, I'm here with the European Apprentice Network. Uh, I, you might think, as an autistic project manager, I'm going to talk about process. And you'd be right, I'm going to talk about process. But I'm also going to talk about the other two important P's, I think, in our industry, which are people and place. We live to serve our passengers and our customers and our communities. We have to build sustainable societies. We have to make sure that transport, and I think the rail industry in particular, plays an enormous role in helping decarbonize the economy and our entire continent and can help with everything from social mobility, getting people to their learnings, to college, to go and visit families and families and all the rest of it. But underpinning all that is, of course, process. I told you we'd come back to process. Um, I had a lovely discussion last night with one of our amazing hosts from Oberbeer about interoperability and going across countries and so forth. And one of the things which Lorenzo and I ended up talking about after that was about uh, a, a, a keeping a bank of shared learning. Now, again, project manager, I love lessons learned. Um, we have a great breadth of companies, organizations, authorities here from right the way across the continent, be it from local, national to European level. All of you have got projects and things that you've done in the past. Some have succeeded, some less so. Not mentioning any from my own country. Um, Crosswell, cough. Um, and I think it's, there's, there's, I'm going to now challenge all of you. Is there a way we can form some kind of, let's call it a portal, share all of the learnings cross boundaries, strip out you know, any financial bits if it, they're embarrassing, but I think we do need to learn from each other because one of the, the biggest things that we ne now need to do is to decarbonize across the economy but, and build a sustainable future. Um, apprentices are obviously leading the way in a lot of these things, bringing in new thinking, new ideas, and of course, as, as Lorenzo and everyone else has already rightly pointed out, uh, the, w the desire to see a better future, driven more by how we can live and, and you know, survive as a, as, a, as a world. So that's my first challenge to you all, is to think about how we can share good practice and make sure that actually what works in one place, if does it, can it work somewhere else? Uh, secondly, I, I do think that actually we have an enormous possibility, and we were talking about this actually in the gender session just now, which I have to admit, amazing, um, about shared recognition of training. So apprentices coming into your businesses, you're training them up, you're spending 80, 100,000 euros sometimes on training these people up. You want them to get a qualification. You want that qualification to be recognized, both within their own country, tied to uh, some kind of qualification, be that this thing I have done with my, my, my uh, uh, industry is equal to a bachelor's, for example. Or I could do, let's say I, I went and joined our amazing host, so Bebe, and I did a, an apprenticeship with them. Can it be recognized by Deutsche Bahn? Can it be recognized by uh, uh, Rail Italia? Can it be recognized if I go down to Bilbao? That, I think, is something which we could do. It helps the mobility across our sector, and it could potentially help solve some, not all, obviously, some of our issues that all of us are experiencing. I work for a rail authority. We all have issues with getting enough people into the right places. Actually, if we start recognizing each other, that helps bring people in from all the way across the continent because it, it gives them that opportunity to move. That's the second thing, so start thinking about that. There is one more. I know I'm, I'm stretched for time, but... So coming back to some of the stuff that, that Lorenzo was talking about, we think that there is the possibility for the rail industry to lead the way 
in being more carbon efficient. So here's a challenge for you all. Can you all save 50% on your operational carbon by 2030? It's a huge ask. I know my organization is struggling with that one as well. But we own an enormous amount of infrastructure. Think about all the space down your lines. What can you do with that? Can you put some more biodiverse planting in? Can you put solar panels on the roofs of your station? Can you do more about water reclamation in your head offices? All of these things, I think, can go back again. Point number one, that shared portal. What can we do as an industry to support that sustainability? And how do you bring your apprentices in on this? Because I guarantee you, just looking at some of the people up here, I am deeply honoured to know a lot of apprentices around Europe who are fundamentally for building a much better society and one that's still going to be here in 50, 100, 200 years. Use your apprentices. Thank you very much for, for, for that, uh, Lorenzo and Simon. That, that's really, like, that, that passion about sustainability is, uh, is infectious. Uh, Ayet, welcome. It's, you're up next. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Hayet. Um, I'm using the pronoun he, uh, no, <laughs> she or her. <laughs> I'm an apprentice in the Human Resources Direction of SNCF in the Training and Skills Development Department. I'm very thankful and honored to be here today to speak about mobility program in the perspective of an apprentice. Uh, Baptiste from the ANAF is here today also, and uh, ANAF is the National Association of Apprenticeship of France. And uh, we also think about the future of mobility with the network, the Apprentices Network. So thank you all for being here and thinking about that subject. So international and European mobility uh, provides an added value in the training of the youth and especially VET learners. On the one hand, it is a springboard for youth employment, giving them overall self-confidence. On the other hand, it reinforces the European citizenship by open-mindedness, enhancement and promoting cultural discovery. Encouraging those mobilities is a key uh, of, for the U European Union for building a strong space of exchange of skills, knowledge, practices and enhancing cooperation in order to face the great challenges that uh, exist in the international uh, level. So things have been done at the European scale, and of course, the Erasmus program exists since 1994, and it had been open since for the apprentices, but sometimes mobilities are still reduced to short ones for them, and because of the persistence of some obstacles. So how can we facilitate for apprentices' mobility, and especially if they want to do their mobility in companies abroad. There is a need for a encouraging exchange of apprentices between firms, between training centers. So what about creating an online platform where apprentices can find easily training centers or host companies, and for companies themselves to find and identify in the whole Europe partnerships. The second idea would be about creating a common status for apprentices. We spoke this morning about harmonization, so this could be a way to harmonize, and also this could be a way to reduce administrative procedures, which really um, um, uh, avoid sometimes the project for the apprentices. And we spoke this morning about social protection, so this is a true subject that we could be uh, getting better. And we can imagine the creation of a European apprentice and vocational training area, as it already exists for higher education with the European higher education area. We could also imagine <laughs> for tutors, which are very and key person in the, uh, in the track of an apprentice, uh, a kind of coaching for them to welcome easily the apprentices inside their structures 
by a system of mentoring, for instance. This to create the proper conditions for learning new skills with a new tutor in a new structure, which, is the very, which are the very DNA of apprentices' mobility. So, last but not least, the European Union has already created tools such as Europass, and that could be widened to respond to the very need of apprentices across Europe, and we can go further with it by developing, for instance, European <coughs> skills passports to enhance their achievements. So, these were some leads about uh, removing the remain obstacles. And this is now in your hands, and I thank you all for your attention. <laughs> wow. So, so there you have it from Hayat, starting off with the aspirations of European citizenship and all of the fields, but she's an apprentice, so there are some practical solutions. Um, and <laughs> now we will fi finish off with, uh, with Juliana. Yeah, hi, um, my name is Uliana. I'm from uh, National Union of Vocational Students in Finland and also the European Apprentice Network. And you can address me by any set of pronouns. Uh, there's no wrong ones. So I'll be talking about uh, gender and gender inclusivity. And of course, there's a high importance of gender inclusivity in general. And when talking about gender, it's mostly about breaking the stigma uh, and ch changing the concept of gender. So uh, as young people, we uh, appreciate the changes made in the past, such as quotas, for example. Uh, but I think it's time for more, more changes. The introduction of quotas uh, in its time and its usage, usage in, pra in practice was a breakthrough. Uh, and now we have more representations of uh, different people in different different industries, but in my opinion, uh, now we uh, need to uh, use positive encouragement and representation, representation to get more people, to get more diversity in the field. Um, because unfortunately, there can never be enough quotas to include all people. To, there there's, will, will always be just a forced number, and, uh, like an estimate, and we can't always like, uh, guess what it will be. So we need to encourage people to uh, engage with the industry. Uh, the easy way to start breaking the gender stigma is to change the language at the company. Uh, the changing the language at your company um, to a uh, gender-sensitive and inclusive language. Uh, also, when talking about language, we need to remember that we need to also include an option of easy language for it to, to be accessible to everybody. Um, using gender-sensitive language includes uh, all people without assuming who they are based on their looks. Um, and of course, language is power and it represents the structure that is used in the company. Uh, language is something that uh, influences how we perceive the world around us, uh, which is why we need to stop uh, making people invisible by using non-inclusive language. Um, and we need to uh, make all apprentices seen by using the inclusive language. Also, bonus point, uh, changing the language in your company does not cost everything. You just, you just start to using uh, correct pronouns, you just start using more inclusive language. Uh, of course, nowadays, the railway industry uh, has members belonging to other genders than male, but they still remain an endangered minority. And to increase the diversity level of people involved in the industry, uh, first thing to do is to raise awareness. And uh, that includes, but it's not limited to, uh, sharing success stories told by workers and apprentices themselves uh, online, in printed editions, and in person. In-person representations can be, uh, for example, inviting people to presentations, forums, uh, professional visits in uh, learning establishments, and so on. Uh, provide, and also providing the safe, safe space for existing and new workers is crucial for successful maintaining of gender diversity in the industry. Firstly, workplace should be equipped with uh, necessary utilities and equipment for all involved, and um, such as uh, changing rooms, bathrooms, and safety gear in the right size. Uh, because to our knowledge, unfortunately, as of now, it's not the case uh, in every establishment. And for example, as of bathrooms, ideally, uh, it should be separate stalls with an individual toilet seat, a sink, and of course, a working lock. Uh, that will provide enough uh, privacy for people to be themselves with, to avoid stress at workplace and uh, quickly address the issue and prevent it from happening further. And that's, I think, in my opinion, it should be mandatory to have a person responsible for that kind of issues. Thank you. Fantastic. Kitos.
Uh, and I would also like to say thank you to you as a group for being uh, the, the group who came on stage and went, I'm okay, I'm going to tell you what my pronouns are. And that, I think, is a really, I think that is a real challenge to me and my generation to, to think about this. So thank you very much. Uh, do we have time for just two questions? One or two? Please? Yeah? Okay, come on, folks. Uh, it is time you... You can ask some apprentices some questions. Do we have any questions? Give us a wave. Hey! It's almost as if there was a plant. Um, <laughs> I have two questions, but it's a simple question. Um, would you say you are happy with your apprenticeship? And if you could, what would you change as an apprentice in your company? Uh, I would like to answer, yes. I would like to answer you, but uh, take in mind that in Italy, uh, our kind of apprenticeship is not like uh, the one in Austria. So we finish high school, and then we, uh, most companies used to hire younger people with the contratto di apprendistato professionalizzante. That is a type of contract that ensures to the company lower, uh, lower taxes. So to make it simple. And uh, personally, I really like this type of uh, employment because it gives you the full coverage of rights that you should have as a worker. Uh, and in particular, uh, in Italy, we have a lot of guarantees uh, under the, um, the side of uh, working and the university student's life. So thanks to this type of guarantees, I, I have been able to uh, continue the university career and finish it. So I think that, uh, in my opinion, uh, this type of employment is really positive for young people and uh, give, gives them the opportunity to basically do what uh, they wish and have the stability to decide even for longer uh, time frame decision that uh, is really important, in my opinion. So. Great. Thank you. And there, uh, so I think your story was all about enjoying being an apprentice, but what would you change? If you could change anything about apprenticeships in SNCB. <laughs> <laughs> She's not listening, it's fine. <laughs> your microphone is off. What would you change if you could change? It's not off, it was a joke. Uh, what would you change if you could change anything about your apprenticeship? Oh, um... I'm thinking. <laughs> okay, you have a think. Simon's definitely got something that he would change. I mean, I, 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 I'm, I'm slightly older than the other apprentices here, so I came to apprenticeships a little bit later in life, having already you know, done 10 years' worth of work and then going for a complete change in, in things. Um, I think one of the things, actually, that I, I think we could change is, obviously, it's the year of youth. We're going to talk about young people as apprentices, but I think we could also sell apprenticeships as being a good retraining tool for people who are a bit older. Maybe if they're coming back into the workplace after uh, caring responsibilities, or actually the role you do no longer really exists and you want to try something new and, and, and learn it, and sort of embed them as part of your lifelong learning thing. There is absolutely nothing wrong with the word apprentice. In fact, that's the thing I would change, is parity of esteem. The word apprenticeship should not be seen as being a second-class form of training or education. I've got apprentices who are doing a PhD. Amazing. Thank you very much, Simon. Ferre, have you had some time to think? <laughs> more young people. More people. More, more apprentices. People. Love it. Absolutely. Yep. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you very much, Ferre. Uh, anybody else got I think more, one more question? Go on, you've nope. all got something burning inside. Go on, you want Fabulous. <laughs> well, we are... Uh, we, Simon, you did talk for a little longer than I told you you could talk. So we are... Oh, we do have... Yeah? So, uh, one question for me. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you all for going up on stage and uh, telling us your pronouns and everything. It means a lot to me personally as well. And to my question, um, how realistic do you... Uh, this question is for um, Laura. Um, how realistic do you personally think it is uh, that we will see fully automatic train operation in the next 50 years or so? Like, do you think that it's actually realistic or do you think there will always need to be some kind of at least observer in I, there? I personally think that is absolutely realistic. 
So that is why we should address uh, really concretely the future of uh, our profession. So I think that maybe with a high probability, uh, I am part of the last generation of train drivers in Europe. So we, think we have to think about really seriously about uh, uh, the changes and how, uh, especially in the next 10 to 15 years, our profession uh, will, be, will be. So I think that, yes, we have the technological innovation to ensure the autonomous train driving. Fab, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, thank you very much, apprentices. Uh, the, if you are interested in the things that the apprentices have said, uh, then some of them will be around. Uh, European Apprentice Network, give us a wave at the back. Uh, so some of us will be around afterwards. Do come and say hello. Can I also just say yeah. thank you for giving us all a voice to come and speak to you here. It's really important that whenever we talk about apprenticeships, apprentices are front and centre. And I know somebody mentioned earlier on about getting apprentices on the stage more often. It really is very much appreciated. You've all got them in your, in your own um, uh, organisations. Talk to them. Thank you very much. Thanks. So I think we need to congratulate our young representatives. They did great. And uh, it's not always easy to share your thoughts when you are so young in front of an audience. So many, many thanks for being here and, and share your thoughts with us. I think we will all commit at least to think about what you said and uh, about the feasibility of your proposals. Some may be difficult, but maybe some will be an inspiration for future actions in the companies or at commission level. So thanks a lot for that. And we came to an end. Uh, it was uh, a very nice day, uh, full of interesting sessions and interesting insights. Many of you shared uh, good practices ongoing projects, um, even requests for support or for EU action in certain areas, we will look into it. But there were also many emotions and even provo provocative uh, interventions and uh, suggestions. So I think they are all very useful and uh, spice up uh, the discussion. So many thanks for that, for your engagement. Uh, all the contributions are welcome and uh, many thanks to all the speakers, the participants, the online participants, uh, apprentices, hosts and organizers. Uh, so special thanks to UBB and also to uh, our team of Ecoris, who are a great team and did a lot of um, uh, support uh, to prepare this, this event uh, that has, has been very successful in my view. So now, for the coming uh, weeks and months, stay tuned for other uh, EAFA uh, activities. Um, I think we just launched a training module that you can check online. There will be a survey, as Kirsten said this morning, so please help us improve uh, for the future with your contribution. And there will be many other things like live discussions, podcasts, and so on, so stay tuned for that. And also for the report on our conference, that will be very interesting, I'm sure about it. So thanks again. Those who stay in Vienna, enjoy. And uh, the rest of us will get back home and uh, see you next time.